Hello, everybody, and welcome to our Friday webinar. Today we are with uh, Lisa Bono. Welcome, Lisa. Hi. And we are covering uh, the gray way, the healthy gray, keeping your bird healthy and happy. So who does not want to learn how to keep their birds healthy and happy? Um, and especially, what a great way to start, um, get off to a start in the new year. And Lisa, last time we saw you, we were giving away fabulous products for our holiday giveaway. I think people are still um, having an enjoyment from that. We get we get some messages every now and again saying, they like my bird loves the toy that I, you know, we're, we're not. Oh, I'm glad that FedEx finally got them on their way. <laughs> yeah. All right. Hey. <laughs> so, so I know you have a screen share, uh, a screen share for us. Um, I'm going to try something. I'm going to give everybody a, a sneak preview of what, uh, while I wait for people to log in, what um, today's giveaway product is going to be for one lucky winner and their bird. So let me try this. <sighs> okay. I always cross my fingers when I'm doing this because sometimes it goes wrong. But here we go. Okay. So today is, let's see if we can get this baby to play. Come on. The uh, Sunny Orchard uh, berries. in all sizes. <laughs> so, it kind of looks like uh, a spring. You know, you can have your, your spring a little bit early uh, with these uh, with these roots and whatnot. Um, so yeah, that's what one of our lucky winners will be receiving today. It's so fun to give these away too because. Um, you know, if, if it's a new product that, that someone's trying or, or they know that it's their bird's favorite, they get more to uh, have. There we go. So that's that's the sneak preview of what we're going to be uh, giving away today. And um, so, Lisa, I think I will let you um, take it away in a second, but I'm just going to give a quick reminder for, especially for those who are new and joining us um, on these webinars, is that if you do have a question for Lisa, to use the Q&A button and not the chat feature, that way we can capture the question. So. Um, so yeah, so use the Q&A button, which is right down, well, on my computer, it's right down below near the chat feature, but use the Q&A button. All right, now that that said, um, I'm gonna let you take it away. I'm sure you've got a lot of ground to cover and I'm sure you'll have a lot of answers to uh, address, or questions yeah. to answer, okay. Yes, okay, let me do this just so everybody knows. The Zoom changed a little bit on me, so just bear with me. All right. One more thing, hold on. Okay. All right, I wanna welcome everybody um, to part eight of the Gray Way series. And this is about helping, keeping your bird healthy and happy. And not only that, also it's important when you have birds to also keep your vet happy. <laughs> and we're gonna kind of try to get into that as well. It's hard to follow that magnificent webinar we saw last week with Dr. Lamb. Um, and I urge everybody to go back and read that one or watch that one as well. So here we go. Basic needs for a lot of people, and I've seen this when I had the store. It was a retail location and I had a lot of people that came in and just really got the basics, meaning food and maybe one toy every couple months. Um, I would work with them a lot with trying to show them homemade toys. And here I have a re retail location, but I'm trying to show them how to make toys just because I didn't feel as if they were getting a lot of stimulation. So just giving them basic food, water, and maybe something to keep them busy. It, no living creature, not us, not anything, is gonna, gonna thrive on just basic needs. So as compassionate, knowledgeable, and evolved beings, we need to offer so much more for them to live happy and healthy lives. So let's kind of touch base on them. I'm sure there's some you'll have questions on that I didn't cover, but here we go. Some nutritional needs. And if you remember uh, the saying, you are what you eat, the same holds true for our birds. A bird that's offered only a seed diet or very basic can have if it's, its lifespan cut short or have illnesses. Improper nutrition can be underlying causes of health and behavioral issues as well. So a lot of times when I'm contacted with people um, online for consulting, I wanna know what their 
eating. Uh, the, a bird's diet should consist of a mainly pelleted formula and supplemented with vegetables, fruits, nuts, and high quality seed if you're going to give them that for an optimal diet. Percentages for how many pellets you should be giving or what kind of pellets are all going to vary depending on who you speak to. We cannot provide the diet that each parrot species encounters in the wild. So it's our goal for our pet birds to provide foods that are well balanced and varied. It's very boring if we have to eat the same thing day, out, day in and day out. When you're out shopping for, this covers any species parrot, you're gonna look for the bright oranges and dark green colors because they have the most nutrition. So it's either, these are some of the things that I use in my own mash that I make. The vegetables that are served raw, um, they contain like the, the carrots, the beta carotenes, those are gonna be the best if they're steamed um, for easily digested, you know, so it doesn't bother them. But the other, other types of veggies you can feed raw. I've never fed any kind of sweet potatoes or anything raw. I've always, I've always cooked just about everything. And you're gonna see up here, if you can see my cursor, it's gonna be the top right picture. That's actually dandelion greens and they're very healthy as well. So if, of course, if you have a lawn service, you're out there spraying, don't get your dandelion greens out of your yard, but you can actually buy them in the store if you look. Fresh or cooked food should be offered daily and should not be left out to spoil. Um, uneaten food should be removed from the cages or play areas is where I usually feed mine. They're wet or, or moist dinners um, after two hours so they don't start to grow bacteria. Vegetables should be given in higher quantities because the fruits contain sugars and can contribute to yeast problems and immune compromised African grays. Eating fruit products more, it also gives more watery droppings. Um, I have a lot of people contact me and they'll say, my bird's not pooping right, and they'll send me pictures. And again, I'll ask them what they ate and they'll say, well, they had just had a bunch of grapes. So that'll make it very watery. And it's not really a cause for alarm because it will go back to being normal after a few more poops. The more exotic and colorful the fruit, the more nutritious, think mangoes, papayas, pomegranates, over grapes, bananas, and really just plain old apples. So this is some of my guys, and this is what I make at night. Some of you have, may have seen this picture. Um, Emma, she goes to everybody's plate, and you can see that um, Abigail stole Sam's plate. But this is, this is the mash that I make up. It's got all kinds of vegetables in it. It's got a little bit of pasta to draw their attention in. That was a picture in the bowl, not necessarily what was or I should say in the pot, not necessarily what was on their plate. So it's a little bit of everything that you could see. And there's a lot of good things. Um, if you're trying something and your bird doesn't like it immediately, don't give up. Keep trying. If you take that sweet potato and they don't like it, maybe the next night put a little pepper on it. If they don't like it that night, maybe the next night put a little um, cinnamon on it. And then the next night, if they don't like it, maybe try a little applesauce mixed in. So it's... It, Every one of my birds has a different preference. So I try to give a mixture so at least somebody's eating something that they like. Now, sprouts are an excellent way to get nutrition in. I could tell you that I have not done these yet. So this is gonna come from my African Gray page. And this is Oscar who does a lot of sprouting for his little Sophia. So, those are the, uh, the, the, the beans and, and such that he used to sprout. And down on the bottom, uh, this thing is very touchy, I'm sorry. Down on the bottom, you will see that Sam also did um, a little comment on my page. And this way it tells you how to, to take care of them and maintain them once they have sprouted and how long to keep them and so on and so forth. I always wanted to do it, I had to get to do it, but I just never have. Maybe one day I'll get ambitious, but it's an excellent source of nutrition for them. You will hear a lot about birds or African grays in specific, but that they need a lot of calcium. 
Um, they suffer from low uh, blood calcium hypoglycemia more than any other species. Um, you'll hear that, you know, they may have seizures or they're falling off their perches or something like that. That's not really something that you go to Facebook for. That's something you contact your vet for. Um, you can offer your, your gray calcium rich vegetables such as greens, kales, mustard greens, broccolis, carrots, dandelion greens, apricots, endives, fig, and okra. Spinach and chard and beet greens should be given sparingly because they're known to block the absorption of calcium. Other sources of calcium are gonna be eggshells, walnuts, hazelnut, and almonds. And a friend of mine and colleague, Kashmir, had uh, mentioned that filberts and hazelnuts are actually very good for African grays. They're not as high in calcium as almonds, but they don't have as much oxalic acid in them to block the calcium absorption. And I'm sure some of these words I'm not saying, right? Because I'm trying to get them out quickly. <laughs> um, pet birds on a quality pelleted diet don't need vitamin or mineral supplementation. That's already in the formulated diet. And over supplementing can be just as dangerous as not having enough in their body. So you want to visit your vet once a year have your blood work done and your chemistry profile performed so you know if your bird is in need of supplementation of any kind. And then you can go into offering more of the foods that I, I mentioned, or they actually have something that they can give you. Um, often birds on an insufficient diet of low calcium levels may develop infections that can be seen on the blood work. That's why that's important. A clean environment. Now, I'm not going to get too much into this because I did a webinar on it. So you guys can go back and review it. But it is very important for your bird's health that it's living in a clean environment. I'm not saying sterile because we can't get that. That's a vet's office. They do everything. But you can't have a bird living in a cage or playing on a stand that's covered with poop. So I can tell you my room does not always look like that. More often than not, it looks like this because here I forgot to lock Emma's door and she had a grand old day throwing everything she could and pooping all over the floor. So, I mean, it happens. Um, and you know, you, you can't leave that there and you, you can't leave the poop on the floor. You, you have to clean it up. So when you're doing your daily cleaning, again, that's Emma making a mess. She had a party at night. Um, you want to make sure that you do a daily cleaning and a week, weekly deep cleaning. You want to clean the cage bottoms. You can line the papers. That's all in the webinar I did. You want to clean the cage grates, the cage bars, if you're feeding your moist or your vegetables in the cage, because again, you want to remove anything after two hours. So if you're feeding them in the cage, you got a little bit more ma you know, maintenance and cleaning to do. If you do it on a play stand, it's a lot easier to clean up what you have to. Um, so you want to clean the cage bars, the play stand, the toys, and the, the, the floors in the room. So this is actually a really, really, really fun room for a bird. I would think it might be a little bit more difficult to clean. So it might be a little harder for if somebody's got a lot of stuff to actually physically take it apart take it outside, wash it down. And so maybe, again, maybe it, it doesn't get done as much as it should. It looks fantastic. I'm sure the birds have a, a blast in that room and maybe the, the owner has it set up in a way that I can't see and it's perfectly fine and they're able to clean it every night and have not a problem. But just keep that in mind when you're designing your, your area or your room that you wanna make sure it's gonna be easy for you to do what you have to do so you do it. Another important thing for the environment is to have clean air um, and air quality. You don't want to have your birds in the kitchen. Um, we had the smoke alarm go off here the other night because my husband was cooking rice and the water just overflowed on the stove. And there was so much smoke in here um, that my alarm went off and my security system people called me 
So we had to throw open all the doors and that was just water. So you don't wanna have the birds in the kitchen for reasons, just like I mentioned. You wanna make sure people aren't spraying anything. Um, the, the chemicals, you know, the, the Febreze who admits is not good to be around birds. Stuff like that you have to be very careful with, perfumes and, and hairsprays. Just don't. Um, I don't, when anybody comes here for a visit, I tell them they cannot use anything like that in the house. No one's allowed to cook but me. And, you know, you should invest if you have a dustier species like a cockatoo, a gray, or a cockatiel, you probably want to invest in a decent air filtration system. Their emotional needs. A lot of times people will put their bird in a room. Um, they build a, a great bird room and the bird stays in there. Parrots are social creatures. This is actually them in the wild. There, you can see no one's alone there because they wouldn't be left alone. If they were, they'd be prime picking for some animal's dinner. So they're always in a flock. And when we set up a bird room, and it's a great idea for sleeping. I have one as well. But if your bird is in there all the time, it's a very lonely life. Our companion parents should be with their flocks as much as possible. A bird in a room by itself will probably scream for attention. And no one wants to hear a screaming bird, no, how, no matter how much we love them. But it's their only communication to let you know they're not happy. You need to try to figure out what they need. And a lot of times if they're out and they're with the family, they're interacting, that's what they want. So you can see my guys are a big part of my life. Um, they are really not in their cages very much. Um, these, this is through the years. Here's uh, Emma actually in a, I believe that was a Black Hawk helicopter. So I don't know how many birds could really say or anybody could say that the birds were, but my husband served in the military. And so we were able to do a couple things. Here's my little bridal party right here. Um, so they've always been a big part of my life. So, and they've always had more than one. So they were always entertained or watching something that was going on in their room. So their environment should always be stress-free. Now, they should not have predators staring at them all day. They should not be locked away for trying to communicate. They should be able to be, know they'll be fed and held every day. And again, that goes back to a routine. A lot of people don't like that word. I see nothing wrong with that word. A routine is not being fed at one o'clock. It means somewhere between 12 and two, they know they're gonna be fed and they don't have to worry about it. They don't have to stress over when their next, next meal is coming. Um, they should have stability in their life. Their environment should not be so noisy that they cannot relax during the day. That's going to stress them out a lot as well. I know all my guys nap. It gets very quiet between 1 and probably 2 o'clock here because everybody's taking a little nap, whether on their tree, whether they're out on, you know, in their cage. They are napping. So if you are in a very, very busy, busy house and you have dogs and you have children and you have people coming in and out and loud music and band practice and everything else. You might want to consider having um, a sleep room or a sleep area that maybe the bird could go to and get a little rest and relaxation so it's not right in the middle of that 24-7. We know from a practical experience and from scientific research that emotions affect the state of an animal's health, whether the animal is a human being or a bird. The more intelligent an animal is, the keener its perception of danger and the greater its stress. Um, this came out of a book and Holistic Care for Birds that I read quite a while ago, um, but this always stuck in my mind. Now, there's some very simple things, if your bird is by a window, like all of my guys are, and all of a sudden they start to shriek or something, you know something's going on. More times than not, there's a hawk outside or there's a crow, I'll go in there, I'll talk to them. If I have to, I'll pull the shade down to get that scary stressed thing away. Another thing is 
other pets. You have your dogs, your cats. They they could be the, the best well-behaved dog, cat, whatever. Um, they are a predator and instinct usually takes over and it doesn't really matter if it's a year or if it's 10 years down the road. So your bird knows that and you want to try to make sure that the bird is not stressed out. So keep keep your anim other animals away um, just for the bird's mental state. And so no accidents happen. Their physical needs. Okay, so these are some of my guys chewing on their toys. Um, what are they gonna destroy today? That's what they're gonna do in the wild. They're gonna go out, they're gonna look for tree branches, they're gonna scratch in the mud, they're gonna have all kinds of fun. And being in our house, we have to try to give them things to do. Um, so it's important that you have the correct toys. Now, this toy over here on my right-hand side, um, that's Sterling chewing on this big long block toy. That toy stayed like that for about four years. What I didn't realize at the time when I purchased it is that it was too hard and too big for him to chew on. So you can see Emma over here with a little foot toy. She's able to get her beak around that. So that didn't last long at all. Sterling never destroyed this. I took it apart. I gave everybody blocks. Nobody bothered with it. So that's how I learned that they like thinner, softer woods. Environmental stimulation. So when they're out in the trees or even in their cages, a lot of times they're going to be looking outside and that keeps them busy as well. That's what they'd be doing in the wild. So here I have my guys, you know, they'll sit there and I'll look out for a while. And like I said, if I hear a screech, I know a hawk's in there or a crow and I have to go in and look and see. Um, Abby does not, this is Abby over here on the left. She's looking outside, looking for squirrels in the snow. She was not, she does not hear for squirrels. We have quite an alarm for them. So, but this gives them something to do as well. If you have them up against the wall, there's nothing to look at. There's nothing to do. So consider having them towards a window that you don't want to have a full window where you can't cover it, where they can't get away from a predator, but you want to make sure they're able to look out. And I prefer having the birds towards the back of the house if you can. So this way, people outside walking by or driving by don't necessarily know what you have in your house. So this is Miss Sam. And this is her favorite thing to do. She watches my neighbors constantly. Yes. So she has all her food there. She has her toys and what's she doing? She's standing still and looking out the window. So this is me looking from their sleep room to see what she was looking at. And I went in there and took the picture and then I sent it to my neighbor. Uh, my neighbor was having a garage sale. So Sam will sit there, she'll watch and she just, every time I go in there and if Sam's fixated out looking out the window, I know my neighbor's up to something. So, you know, I'll look out and make sure that everything's going okay. They really need to have a lot of out of the cage time. And this could be whether sitting with you on the couch or Miss Abby over here, her little side profession as a Harley Davidson model. Um, but you want to have them out so they can interact and exercise because being a perch potato is going to lead to emotional problems and physical problems. So if they're out and they're moving around, that's what you want to do. None of us would want to stand in a closet all day long. Stimulation, again, that can, this is just from the environment. This is different things they can be doing. You have um, Gus over there watching Buffy and Shabaka watching okay. baseball. So Emma's in the middle, she was watching the Golden Girls. Um, Tika, I had a video, but I couldn't attach it. And, but Tika likes to play with Alexa. So he'll turn it on and they'll have a grand old time. And then you have Rocky over there seems to be a little bit more sophisticated and he likes to sit there and read with his owner. 
So I thought that was really cute. But this is all interaction. It's all stimulation. It's all keeping them busy. Even though it's little things, it's keeping them busy. Um, you also want to make sure if, and I think pretty much all TVs are now, um, not that I know what this means, but you want to make sure you have a TV that's over uh, 1,080 DPI. Um, this way, they, the birds see differently than we do. So if you have a TV that's lower than that, they're not going to see a full picture. They're going to see lots of little pictures. And that might stress them out a little bit more. So just be aware. Um, you know, I know ours are, but I was sitting in a lecture and they had mentioned that, you know, the flicker effect and the birds sitting in front of the TVs and, you know, how it might affect them. Also, certain lights, same thing, flicker effect. We don't see it, but, you know, certain light bulbs can give off disco effects and, you know, that can also bother them as well. So there's a lot of things that are going on in the environment you have to watch. So here we have bathing opportunities. This is something that's very important. They need to be able to keep clean. So here I have pictures of Abby. She's sitting in a big Corel bowl. And that is how most of my guys prefer to take a bath. You have Sterling down here in a little corner as I, I had a bird room in one of my homes and I put a sink in there and that's where they used to go in and take their baths. I used to line up toys on each side and Sterling would pull the toys in and talk to him. Um, he would want me to leave the room because he would just stand there and stare at me. And if I just walked around the corner and sat down, uh, when he was done, you'd hear him say, come here, come on. And that would be my cue to go back in and get him. But it's very important for them to have a bath. They might like being in the shower. You know, there's, there's a, a lot of different ways some might like to be sprayed, but just make sure however they're doing it, that they enjoy doing it. You don't want them sitting there and, and being sprayed and having a horrible time because that's not doing anything for your relationship. So one of the most important things is exercise. I guess it, it, it's okay for me to talk about this. The way I equate it is not every, not every home can have fully flighted birds. And I understand that. So we need to keep the birds occupied in a different way. Um, I do have my guys fully flighted and there's definite benefits to it, but I can control every aspect of my environment. So that's important. And it is healthier looking at a perspective of a person who has been injured and laying in bed what happened to their body. And I can talk about that because I had a nephew who was in a coma. So I watched him over the years, how his body changed and deteriorated because he wasn't able to do the things that was normal. He couldn't walk, he couldn't raise his arms, he couldn't do anything of that. So when you have a bird that's a perch potato and doesn't get out and doesn't flap, doesn't play, doesn't you know, climb around, you kind of have the same thing, the deterioration of the body, the mind, and you're not gonna have a healthy bird. So we have to have some kind of exercise and we'll talk about some ways that we can. Now, this is from Aviator Harness. This is from Steve. And these are some of the things that actually having a fully flighted bird is beneficial and it shows you how the body reacts if they are able to do their exercise. Now the aviator harness, um, that's the one that I use. It's a safe one. Um, but you know, whenever I go out, I either have them in a carrier or I have them on a harness, depending on where I'm going. And I'm letting them fly around and I know that I'm giving them the best and their body is reacting well with all this stuff going on. So how can you keep your bird moving? Well, if you have a play stand, you can create a little area. You have things you can hang from the ceiling. I know this needs to be trimmed right here and it was right after the picture. Um, they have to climb from perch to top to boing. So that is all moving around. Now Emma's play stand here that she's standing on on the left that was a very boring play stand. There wasn't really anywhere for her to go. Every once in a while, she'd hang upside down from the ladder. 
but she really needed to move around as well. When I'm trying to get my guys to step up, I don't necessarily go right into their, their belly and say, come on, step up. If they're on a flat surface, like Abby's on a couch, I will put my hand close to her and have her walk to me to step up. Again, it's just little things, but it all adds up. Another thing that I used to do a lot with Sydney before he had all these places to climb around and I didn't have a play stand is I would put a towel on my coffee table and I had a little bell or a ball similar to this, but it was safe. And what I would do is I would sit on one side of the coffee table, my husband on the other side, and we would roll the ball back and forth and Sydney would run in the middle and chase it, and pick it up and throw it. And we would have to go chase it. So that was excellent exercise for him. And, you know, he did get very excited. So you do have to watch, you know, where your hand is versus the ball. But that was excellent opportunity for him to move around and get a lot of exercise and get that blood pumping. Another thing you could do and how I taught my guys to fly, my guys were clipped before my husband was deployed because I could not control my environment. I could not control if they left the toilet seat up or if he was going to walk in a door or anything like that, leave a pot in the sink. When he deployed, I was home alone for a year and a half. And that's when I decided that everybody's wings are going to grow in. We're going to let them fly around. And what I would do is I would hold one of them on my hand like this, and we would, we would walk fast. And they would start flapping. And then as their wings grow in, they ended up just taking up off my hand. Um, and then when my husband came home, we had to retrain him. And I put notes on all the doors you know and on the toilet and everything else for him to become aware of his environment and we took safety precautions and now we're we're pretty decent he turns around and he looks and makes sure that you know everybody is enclosed somewhere whether it's in their room or whether it's in their cage before he opens any kind of doors so it can be done and they can they can learn to become extremely graceful flyers. So um, this might have been touched upon last week, so I don't want to really get too much into this. But right around three is if your bird is going to be flying. This is, this is usually what you're going to see. The keel bone runs down the front of the bird, and you can usually feel it if you touch their belly. Now, when Sam came to me, she did not fly, and she was kind of like a five. She really had some cleavage going on. Um, with her learning how to fly and fly really good and to her tree every morning and back to her house, uh, she is about a three now. So this is kind of what your vet wants to see. You're going to have some that are going to be maybe a little bit skinnier, but like humans, the birds are individuals, so this is kind of like a baseline. So you might have a really great flyer, healthy bird that's a little skinnier, or you might have a great flyer that's just a little bit heavier. But normal, normal is going to be about three if you have somebody that's flying. And one of the most important relationships, and I've said this before, and I can't stress this enough, is going to be the relationship you have with your veterinarian. Okay. Um, you have to work together to ensure the bird is going to stay happy and healthy. And we're going to get into that a little bit. What's going to make your vet very happy if you have to go in for some reason. So how to make your vet happy. This is actually Emma. She had a sty in her eye and we went to visit Dr. Nicole Wire at the University of um, Pennsylvania. Uh, in Philadelphia. And this picture is out of Maggie Wright's African Grey Parrot book. So little Miss Emma's in there. And when I go to the vet, what I do is I make a detailed, I guess, list of how the birds are kept, what they're eating, and so on and so forth. So this way, the vet can look at all this information have it right in front of them. They don't have to remember what food or their, whatever they're eating. They can have it right in front of them, make a recommendation or look at it and say, that's good, let's move on. Because if you have a sick bird, you, you, you do have to move quick. So what's gonna keep your vet happy is if you keep a daily log of the weight. Because they're gonna ask you, do you know the weighted bird? And these scales 
are pretty inexpensive. And as you can see, Emma is a tiny little girl at 351 after her poop. And this is Sam, three, uh, yeah, 457. This is their baseline. So I know if Emma goes down, um, they usually say 10%, I believe. Uh, I know I have a problem and I can bring that log to the vet so that the vet can see when this started to, to come on. You always gotta have a safe travel cage. There's nothing worse than a bird being in like a tiny little cage that the vet has to take the top off of and the bird comes flying out or has to get them through a little door. You wanna make sure you have a good travel cage and you can see I'm walking uh, my Amazon up here and he is in a cat carrier. He was having problems standing. So he's in a cat carrier, big enough door for him to be open and then brought out safely. And these are other options that I use as well, but it's gonna make the vet visit a lot easier if your vet can get the bird out and it's not stressful. You wanna make sure you write down your cage sizes, the brands, and if you can, take a picture. If you can, print it out. My vets have all this information. So even though the cages are pretty much the same, I have three of the exact same cages, my vets know who's in what cage and they can look at it and say, okay, the cage is good, the cage is stainless, big enough, next thing. So make sure you take one of those with you. If they have access to sunlight or full spectrum lighting, you want to you want to write down that. You want them to know how many day, you know, how many hours the full spectrum lighting is on. You want to let them know how often they're outside. Um, it, it's it's very important for a gray to make sure that they're getting enough vitamin D. Now our windows, after I think it's 1974, have a coating on it that's going to block the rays. So being by a window is not necessarily gonna give them what they need to be happy and healthy. And they need the, the vitamin D from the sunlight to maintain healthy calcium levels. So again, that's something you wanna write down and let the vet know. Now, if you're going into full spectrum lighting, my personal thought is I don't care for the ones that are on next to the cage. I like to, per, I like to hang them over the cage. Reason being, again, in one of the lectures I attended, you don't want to have the bird looking at the light. That can make them go blind. So if it's up overhead, they're not staring directly into a light. So take that into consideration when you're getting one. Take a picture of any of the play areas that your bird may use. You know, your vet might look over at this toy and say, ah, all right, the bird's not doing well. I see this chain on right here, might be zinc. So you want to make sure they can look and say, okay, good, not good, move on. If they have sleep, separate sleeping cages, include a picture of that because they're going to ask you, where's the bird located? You know, how much sleep is it getting? If that's why it's lethargic, you could say, here's your sleep room, there's their cage, those are the hours they're in it. All right, move on. Write down what the bird eats on a daily basis. This little guy right here is supposed to be moving, but he's not. Um, I know my my bowls are a little overfilled there, but the thing is, is if I'm going out, I want to make sure that if Emma throws her food, she's got more than enough because um, she's good for that. So, and then this food all gets transferred into their night cages. <clears throat> but you want to take you know, you want to write down or take a picture, and even better. Take a sample of the food with you. I'm, I'm known to do that too. Just take it, take a handful. Now I use several different things in the mix that I make together. So if your vet is not familiar with a, a certain pellet that you're using or a certain seed blend, you know, or a treat, you bring it with you so they can look at it and say, okay, yeah, all right. I didn't know that was the name of it, but we're good. And that's a good thing. So I happen to use a senior bird because the majority of my guys are seniors. My youngest just turned 19. So I use the, um, the senior Nutriberries. And when they first came out, of course, a lot of the vets didn't know what it was. So, you know, I didn't bring the bag. I brought a pellet with me so they would know. If you have audio or video 
of the reason your bird's being presented to your vet, please show them. Um, again, this little guy was limping, so he's not moving and I don't know why. Um, all right, so here we got some feather plucking. That is my house. That was Sydney one day. Then you have Sydney over here again. He's my little trouble boy. He flew, hit the hardwood floor and broke his beak. Down here below him is actually the piece of beak. So what I did was I texted my vets and I actually went on Facebook because I'm um, friendly with a lot of them on Facebook as well. So I send them these pictures and say, okay, what do I got to do? Do I got to come right in? This is the problem. Here's the piece of beak, here's the blood. So, you know, if you're going to the vet, you need to bring that in so that the vet knows how much of the beak broke off. Now, this is little Sam here in the middle. One day, um, her eye was just starting to close and I didn't understand what was going on. So we took the uh, 100 mile trip up to the board certified vet in our area, um, who I adore. And Sam had her eye looked at and we really couldn't find too much, but we did some kind of drops. And down here in the left-hand corner, that was a hard eye booger that came out. And there were several of them. So the only thing I can think of is that she landed on a carpet and the backing of the carpet, you know, every once in a while, the little pieces break off and that got in her eye. That's the only thing I can think of. But if I did, I, I sent this to my vet as well after it came out. So she had a record of it as well. So again, it's real important, you know, if you're showing your friends the video on Facebook, trying to get opinions, you want to make sure you're showing your vet the same thing. I tell people that all the time. It's important. So if your bird is sick, you want to try to learn all you can from the people who walked before you. A lot of people will reach out to me and ask me questions with um, PDD or AGG. Um, thank God, knock on wood, I have not had to deal with that. And I hope to never have to deal with that. But I have had to deal with aspergillosis. So I will reach out to people who are going through that and I can help them maybe understand the medications or why they have to do what they have to do. But you want to try to learn from people who have been in your position and know what they're talking about. This way, you, you know, if you go home, you find out you have a diagnosis, you go home, you do all the research you can to find out about that disease or that illness or what's going on. So you can be an educated partner with your vet to get your bird better, okay? Make sure you're reading some, you know, information that's not out from the 90s, because a lot of books were written back then. And while some information is the same, a lot of it's evolved because we've learned through the years. So if you're reading something, check the date on it. You know, there might be some updates. Whatever you do, don't just go on Facebook or Instagram or any other social media and try to get advice from all the internet experts. Um, if you need to reach out to a more experienced vet for a second opinion, please do. Most vets don't mind you doing that. Sometimes they welcome it. If it's something they haven't seen, it's more hands-on. Um, I'm happy to say I always have a team of vets that you know I might have one hand on and then everybody else gets mass emails so I know what's going on. Um, but just don't ignore what your vet's telling you to go with an opinion of someone online. That's not going to keep your bird healthy. So hopefully if you are able to do some of the things that I mentioned, hopefully you'll have a happy little flock, healthy little flock, and your vet will be very happy with you as well. So I included this little picture down here to the left, and this is Sydney. And you can see that he plucks. And I want all the people out there that have African grays or any other bird that plucks, you can see that all my guys have the same of everything. Um, they get the same types of food, same exercise, same gym, same cages, same outside time, same carrier, same everything. Yet, sometimes you have a bird that plucks. And I don't want those people to think that they're less of an owner 
because they have a little naked bird or they have areas that pluck. Sometimes you will have this. Um, you could see Sydney's a male, strong started a little bit right here. That was probably a little bit of the hormones going on. So this is Sydney up here with his feathers. So you could see that he's kind of a repeat offender. Um, so don't ever think you're doing something wrong or you're less of an owner because you have a bird that plucks. The, I'm sure eventually they're going to find out, and I've talked to some people about this, that they're going to find out that plucking sometimes comes down to genetics. No matter how good you are, no matter what you do, sometimes it happens. And if you have an incident like that, you go to the vet, you just don't buy a collar and stick them on um, because that's not getting to the root of the problem that there may be. So I want to thank you for joining in. And I wanted to put this up here for Angela because I saw her little comment and I wanted to let her know I appreciate her too. So yes, thank you very much. And we will, let me see, stop share and go into questions. Okay. Wow, that was fascinating. That, that bird room looks so spotless. I, I, I have bird jealousy because that's, yeah, it's a lot of, that's a lot of maintenance. I mean, that you just make it look so pristine. Um, it's, 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 like I said, it's not always like that. And there's five of them in there. Five preening, flapping, throwing, pooping beings in there. So, yeah. yeah. You know, you mentioned earlier, Lisa, as it for some questions um, that, uh, about, you know, you, you would let, you know, you and your husband would, would, would coordinate when you have a bird out that's, that's, you know, that's free flighted and stuff. I remember um, we used to have a, we'll have to, we'll have to see if we can create one for a download, but we used to have a, a downloadable, when I was at Bird Talk, a sign that, that, that like you would post, you could print and post and be like, uh, caution, you know, uh, birds, free flight birds out. So, you know, and then just kind of put the sign up to remind your household members or visitors that you have your, your bird out. Um, that, that is probably where I saw it and <laughs> got the idea from. So. Especially when you have multiples in the household to kind of help to coordinate together, like, hey, the birds are out or the bird is out. So. Yeah. You know. And I pretty much kept the signs on the doors all the time. So we'd have to look, you know, so it wasn't like I kept putting them up and down because then there's a chance I might forget as well. Ah. And my bird room where it is, is directly to my front door. So it's one straight flight. So, um, you know, even if we're getting pizza delivered or something, you know, we know they're coming, the headlights turn in driveway. I go into bird room, I stand there, I close the doors and he answers the front door. There you go. Yeah. There you go. Or you put beads up. <laughs> Yep. Well, Sterling would probably chew right through the beads. Oh, yeah, they might think of it as a bird toy. Some birds might think of it as a bird toy. Uh, and then, so I just wanted to remind um, our viewers that that our webinars are on the YouTube channel, because we, we do have a lot of people. Uh, the TV thing seemed to be fascinating. Uh, I don't think a lot of people are aware of the, um, is it the hurt? The, the, the frequency of the, of the TV. Um, well, I used to show, I had a binder. Um, and it was at one of the festivals I went to, and we, it was all about the eyes. And probably Dr. O can tell you a little bit more about it. She may have been in on it. Um, she might have been on the panel for it. But the way they see is instead of looking at a screen like a TV, like we would see, they would see thousands of little squares. Okay. Mm -hmm. So instead of seeing a solid picture, they're seeing something that's going like this. And that's going to be stressful. I mean, if our eyes were going like that, we, we would be a little concerned. So um, they do see much differently. They have different cones and different receptors than we have. Um, same thing with the lights. That's why you have to, you know, you have to be careful with what kind of lighting you use. And don't ask me what it is offhand. Um, but you have to be careful with what you use because some do flicker like, um, you know, like a disco ball. Yeah. And that's going to stress them out too. Just imagine if you live with that 24 seven. No, that'd be bad. I'm only used to that during Halloween time when you see people go by the those flashing lights. So, uh, and, sorry. and see, that's what's when you're, you're working with a behavior consultant, we look into all these different things that are going on. So, you know, a lot of people will ask and say, well, my bird's biting. Why? I can't give you that 
answer without knowing all this other stuff. And even if I send my form out, because there's a lot of questions on there, I want to make sure I'm giving out the correct information, not just picking something out of the air. I would say probably maybe one out of 10 will actually fill out the information and get it back to me. Um, whereas they'll go on Facebook and ask the same question and have 15 different answers that are off the wall. So, you know, you, ha you, have, to, you have to take everything in the environment into consideration to make sure it's st stress-free. All right. Uh, hey, so I have a question for you from Michelle about, uh, they mentioned that most of the time their bird, uh, Gracie, does not want to come out of the cage. Is it, it's kind of up to her. Is that okay to let your bird, you know, have the door open, but they might not want to venture out of it? Yeah, I would, I, would, I would suggest putting a perch on the door and start working with getting her out that way. Um, if she wants to reach out to me, I can show her, or I, it might have been covered in one of my webinars I did as well, um, teaching them to station on that perch and then slowly opening the door and getting them out and then, you know, treating them, giving them a treat that way. This way, they'll want to come out more. It's a reward to come out. It's a reward to get the treat. You know, you could sit there and you could read to them and just interact without physically touching them, and they'll look forward to that. You know, if they don't want to come out, that, that's fine. But they'll look forward to coming out if it's more than just the door open and nothing going on. Okay. Uh, and then we have a, uh, oh, we have a question from uh, Dr. Sogo, who is in Japan. So thank you for joining us. Um, I'm sure the time difference might be a little different. Uh, what is the guideline for the time exposed to artificial lights in the room? The owner at, um, is at work within the day, during the daytime. So is there... Um, I imagine if you're using, you know, the, the, the ultraviolet full light. Spectrum. Okay. Full spectrum. I never went above five hours. I'm crying. Um, with breeding season coming in, a lot of the doctors had said that what you want to do is when the sun comes up, there's your light. And when it goes down, that's the end of the light. You don't want to have artificial uh, lighting on to extend their day when it's hormone season, because then you have birds want to breed when the food is plentiful, when it's not raining, when they feel secure and there's plenty of light, that's usually breeding season. So if you're using artificial light and I always used it during a day, during regular hours, I only had mine on for five hours. Okay. Uh, and. Uh... Nan wanted to know, they say they take their Amazon out regularly, but how long should they, they actually be out each time? Is there a limit? <laughs> There's not, not really a limit. If you guys are having fun um, and the weather's good and you can get in the shade, I, you know, I don't, I don't really think it, depending on the Amazon, there's not a lot of, not a lot of facial stuff that can get, you know, burnt, you know, not like a bear eyed cockatoo. Um, so I don't think there's really any issues. I mean, I've been out 15 minutes and I've been out hours with mine. So it doesn't really matter. It's just routine to make sure they continue to get that. Okay. I imagine, you know, that they have some shade and water available, all the, the precautions that you've recommended. Right. Uh, just as you would for a child. You need to take them out. You make sure they can get under an umbrella. You got their, their food, their water, you know. Yeah, like where you're planning for a beach or park day. That's, yeah, that's exactly right. Uh, okay, and Angela wanted to, uh, to, first of all, thank you for uh, um, so much for your advice. Um, how often should we bathe grays? Um, they spray theirs every day. Uh, is that too much? I don't know if I would do every day. That's just me. I mean, there might not be an issue. You might not be getting a total soaking. Um, with the weather being colder, I don't do it as much especially because we've had quite a bit of snow down here this year in South Carolina. So we don't do it as much, but I, I would think optimum would probably be two or three times a week for a deep soaking, like my Abby gets in the bowl or Sterling gets in the, in the sink. Um, if it's a misting, I'm sure that's not going to do any damage. Just make sure it's done earlier in the day versus at night where they have time to be in the sun and dry off and stuff before going to bed. All right. 
And then and Nikki wanted to know where do you uh, where do you get those uh, floor play stands that you have? Are they your fabulous floor? Uh, uh, actually, play stands? Yeah, actually the the tree play stands. Um, one of our um, people that actually was part of the Christmas holiday is King's Cages. And so they have quite a few. Now, if you want, if she wants to contact me, I can look through and see if we can find any that would be appropriate for her species. You don't want to buy one sight unseen because nine out of 10 of them are, you know, the branches are going to be going straight up in the air. You want to make sure there's branches that they can get to. Um, I used to really enjoy hand picking them for clients. You know, I would take a mon Monday and I'd go up there and I'd dig through thousands of trees and have fun. Um, sadly, I can't do that anymore, but I can still, you know, see if I can see something appropriate. Yeah, they're all unique, right? Um, yeah, they're, they're the tree, so you never know what you're getting. All right. And then Tina, I want to know, what are your thoughts on the uh, small amounts of cheese? Specifically, she mentions Colby Jack. Um, uh, so her uh, Tuki was raised on daily cube of cheese since he was a baby long after, long before that they got him. Um, the different vets have different views and she thinks that the calcium in cheese is something he really needs and tolerates it in small amounts. But what are your thoughts? Okay, I'm going to, I'm going to go with the vets on this because that's who I learned from. Um, I believe they said cheddar cheese was the best because it doesn't have the enzyme that the other cheese have in it. If I'm saying the right word, um, I think it's enzyme that upsets their stomachs. Um, so I would go with a little slice of cheddar versus the other ones. That, that's just my thought. I have not personally done it. Um, but I know people that have done, it's always been cheddar, it's always been a little cube, and it's always come under the advice of their bit. Okay. Um, and Michelle wanted to know your preference for UV lights. So they're looking into the M&M Cage Company lighting brand specifically. Do you, are you, uh, any thoughts on that? Any? I am not familiar with that brand. But again, I would have them reach out to me and we'll go over some options. Some of my vets really like the uh, ZoomEd. But again, you got to make sure you have the correct fixture for it. Um, I have another brand. Um, I use Featherbright. Um, they've changed their fixtures a little bit since. So, you know, there's two light bulbs versus one. There's other companies that are coming out with them now. Um, that I'm not overly familiar with. I know the M&M is a strip that looks more like a little LED. Um, I'm not sure. And I haven't heard any of the vets mention it, so. So I think remember they, um, they do have expiration dates, right? That you need to pay attention to, like the lights, they don't just last forever, like. Um... Yes. Yeah, uh, I, I believe Feather Bright, the ones that I used and I sold in the store were six months. Okay. And then last question is from Michelle. Uh, do you have a cage brand recommendations? Uh, Gracie needs a new cage with a proper play top. So, um, which is great. You know, you're always looking out for your flock and, and upgrading right. a cage is something that should be considered. Okay. Um, there's, there's different brands. One of my favorite brands, if you can find right now, is going to be Avian Adventure. Um, I'm hearing that they're stopping making the cages. If you're looking into stainless steel, um, Featherland has one that I do have a couple cages by them, but they're not really meant to be moved. So if you want a, a sturdier stainless steel, um, that's still pocketbook friendly, um, A&E. And then I, for the powder coated ones, I do prefer Kings. I sold a lot of King's cages in, um, in the store. So okay. you, want, you want to make sure when you're looking at cages, I know the white ones are really pretty. Um, you know, they might fit better in your, your, your home. But the thing is with any white cage by any company, I don't care who it is, the bird moving around or the bird chewing on the bars, they're going to chew the paint off. Now, some of these companies have also had their, their paint tested for lead and zinc through the years, which is good. Others, 
you know, the ones on eBay and all that kind of stuff, you don't know where they're coming from. They haven't been tested and then, they end, then you end up having to go to the vet and you're not saving any kind of money. Um, if you're looking at a cage, you want to try to start, uh, stay with the darker colors. They have black vein, which is like a black with silver going through it. It's, it doesn't sound pretty, but it actually is. If you have an African gray, it hides the dust. And if the bird happens to chew on it, the bar underneath is going to be similar color versus a white cage with a blackish bar. You won't see it as much. All right. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, you know, it's always a, it's an important, it's an important purchase for your bird. So um, probably want to, you know, invest some time looking into the features that you want as well, you know, like rolling uh, a rolling cage when you can move around a room and um, right and and anybody's welcome to, to contact me and we'll go over the pros and cons of each each one you know I've, I've sold thousands of cages and trees and stuff so all right well thank you i think that that's all we have time for the questions today um thank you again lisa for for logging in uh, your time and uh your knowledge sharing it with everybody it's very important that um uh, that we learn these, um, you know, these important care and maintenance for our flock members. Um, and just give everybody a reminder that next Friday we are on with Dr. Tom Pulley again for Ask the Vet. And Lisa, I believe we'll see you back in March. I can't believe February is just flying by. <laughs> I know, right? Yeah. Exactly. Um, okay, so today's today's winner, um, our, today's giveaway winner is going to be Sandy P. Congratulations, Sandy. Um, and again, uh, it's, I gave a preview of what we were giving away um, at the beginning of the webinar. And I will, I will sign us off with the, the video of um, the Sunny Orchard treats as well. Uh, okay, here we go. Let me try to do my screen share again. This time, I'm gonna try to play the one with the Royal, uh, Dr. Lamb's um, Amazon, enjoying. Royal just got in these new new berries that he had before. These ones have cranberries, apricots, and dates. I did load foraging toys yeah. in his house here. So let's see what he thinks. He's on his tree stand. Oh, there he is. There he goes. Arroyo is our uh, Le Fever uh, product tester. He's happily uh, <laughs> happily trying out all the treats that we give away on our webinars. Um, look at that. <laughs> I'm sure Gray's would, uh, they would, they, they'd probably figure out these foraging toys too, to get to some Nutri Berries. <laughs> Is that pretty good? There you go. Sandy, Ooh. that's going out to you and your flock, and you also there. get another bag of paper toys. usually means door. pretty good. Yeah? yeah? I think you must be satisfied with this new flavor. There's nothing better than hearing Good a happy job, bird Royal. squeal, right? <laughs> there we go. What do you think about this new flavor? You haven't got to have this one before. Is it good? Yeah? Do you find it enjoyable? Mm. <laughs> there we go. All right. That's eye -pinning. It's really good, huh? There we go. Um, yeah, I just got in these new nutri berries that he hasn't nope, had before. Wrong, have <laughs> cranberries, apricots, and dates. All right, that's it. Um, that's going out to you, Sandy. And uh, Lisa, again, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for all this information and your screen share and all the wonderful photos of you and your flock. And we look forward to seeing you back in March. All right, everybody, have a great weekend. Um, in the meantime, until next time, all the best to you and your flock and stay safe. Bye.